Well, we are continuing our study uh, of Isaiah chapter 60, the Isaiah 60 generation. The Isaiah 60 generation is that end times uh, people of God moving and living in the glory of God in the end days, or the end times, the last days. And of course, many believers believe that we're in the last days. And in fact, we have to be in the last days because the last days, really, biblically speaking, are the time of Christ onward, what we would call A.D. or Anno Domini. Um, and so the further that we go into that, and we're now 2,000-some years into that, um, the further we go into that, the more in the last days we are. And, of course, the last days, there are many promises. Um, and the Isaiah 60 is a wonderful chapter that tells us of the glories that God wants us to walk in in these end times. Arise, shine, verse 1, for the light is come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Yeah, hands up if you want the glory of the Lord to rise upon thee. Amen? And to, to shine. And, you know, um, I believe last night there was a shining uh, in the hydro and that the gospel went forth. Many Christians gathered together bringing uh, friends and relatives to come to the light of the world that is Jesus. Amen. And of course, Jesus then says that we are the light of the world. So we want more and more people to come to the light, especially in this dark city. And Glasgow is a dark city. We might have uh, more street lights than ever. Uh, we might have more mod cons than ever. Um, we might not have the gritty tenements of old that some of us remember. But folks, it's still a dark city spiritually. And so we want the light to shine in the darkness. And not just in Glasgow, but across the, the earth. And where you live, some of the dark places I know some of you live. I won't mention Blantyre. I won't mention <laughs> Cumber Old. Um, but we all live in, in, in dark times because of just the times that we live in. But the Bible promises that the light is going to shine. It says here, verse 2, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. In other words, great darkness. Um, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. The answer to what's out there in terms of darkness and spiritual wickedness and all the things that are going on in the earth right now, the answer to that is the light and glory of God. And it's not just the light and glory of God shining up in the sky somewhere like, 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 like Batman's beacon. No, it says it shall be seen upon thee. It shall arise upon thee. We are the ones that are supposed to shine with the light and glory of God. It's not separate from us. It's part of who we are in him. And it says, and the Gentiles, which is just a, a word that means nations, the nations shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of their rising. We've looked at that in the last few weeks. What he's saying here is that the light that is in you and I and upon you and I is supposed to be a magnet, if you like, that attracts the, the nations and their kings or their leaders. Amen? So something has to happen in the people of God, in the church, in the ecclesia, in, in the Zion people of God, something has to happen that rather than them getting up on a Sunday morning, seeing us going to church and saying, that's those religious nutters away again. Something has to happen that they say, oh, hold on, can you take me with you? And that thing that has to happen is that the light and glory of God is seen upon us. In other words, God reveals our true identity as sons and daughters of the living God. And you and I ought to be praying for that. You and I ought to be believing for that. Because wouldn't it be nice to say, well, I've got three seats in my car if you want to come along. Wouldn't it be nice to come round the corner there and there's a queue going up the street of people waiting to get in here to church, to Foundry Boys on a Sunday morning or in the gathering on a Saturday morning. Or in fact, we just come in to clean the church and there's people out there. I was just hoping that, that somebody would come. That's what the Bible's talking about here. And we need to start believing for that. He says, lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. 
Now, I know there's people here that remember this church being full. So you, so you know what I'm talking about. You know, the pictures that we have and some of you, the memories that you have. When you came here, you had to maybe come early to get a seat or, or to get a good seat. Uh, but the, the place was much more full. And what, that's the experience of most churches, particularly of a certain age, in Scotland today, that there were times in the past where maybe the place was packed every Sunday morning, but it's not so packed now. But brothers and sisters, and I'm not even talking about churches where you know, great things were, were going on. Most churches, you could argue, at one stage in the last few decades, well, every church probably mostly, had more people coming. And what God's word promises is that in the last days, in, in the times we live in, that is going to be the case. That lift, He's saying, lift up your eyes and see. Now, he's not saying you lift up your physical eyes. He's asking us to see by the eyes of faith. Do we believe with the eyes of faith today that you will struggle to get a seat in here if you come before half, if you come after half ten on a Lord's Day morning? Do we believe that? Because we need to start believing it. Why? Because according to your faith, be it unto you. So when he says, lift up your eyes, they're coming, they gather. Thy son shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed or carried at thy side. When he speaks about sons and daughters, he's speaking about exactly what took place in the hydro last night, in that people became children of the living God. In other words, when you become a Christian, you become a son and daughter of God. He's talking about sons and daughters, and he's saying sons and daughters are coming. And what that means for you and I, brothers and sisters, is this. Harvest time is coming. People coming to know Jesus and coming to our church to know him are coming to our church once they've known him. And that's what he's saying. They come to thee, they gather. Okay? In other words, we have to have a vision for Glasgow that we've just spoke about, that Glasgow would flourish by the preaching of your word and the praising of, of your name. What does that mean? It means where his word is truly preached, sons and daughters will be born into the kingdom of God. And that's what we're believing for. And I want to say this, if you don't come to church looking for that, believing for that, hoping for that, longing for that, then what do you come for? And I can tell you this right now, because she's not here. Agnes's cooking isn't that great. <laughs> it's wonderful, but it's not enough to get you out of bed on a Sunday morning. I hope she's not listening. Thank, thank, thank the Lord that we don't have the sermon piped through in a speaker. <laughs> or, or it should be around there with a rolling pin just now. But you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it's not for things like that. The reason we come to church is because we want to see a move of God in the earth. Amen? And then he says, Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thy heart shall fear and be enlarged. Your heart will throb, it means with excitement because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee that, that phrase means the wealth of the nation shall come unto thee now, he's talking about wealth transfer that, that word forces there is the Hebrew word kyle and it means it's a wonderful word because it means wealth riches, money, treasures all those wonderful things but it also has the sense of abundance of people, of armies, of hosts of people coming. In other words, it's saying the same thing here. Multitudes coming to know the Lord. We ought to be encouraged with what took place last night. And not just the, the Billy Graham thing, but other endeavours that are going on to get people in Glasgow to come to know Jesus. People in the west of Scotland and the whole of Scotland to come to know him. That ought to be what our hearts uh, are burning with, to see these things. These, the, the wealth of a nation shall come unto thee, or the multitudes of people come unto thee. Amen? Can we make that um, our heart's desire and therefore something that animates our prayer? Verse 8 says, Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? And he's talking about how, you know how doves flock, doves flock together. And he, again, he's talking about m multitudes. You know, 
we ought to have multitudes on our mind. We ought to say to ourselves those days of old in here, when the, the big church was packed and so on, and this room was packed, we ought to be saying to ourselves, do it again, Lord, but do it far greater. Amen. Amen. So, um, you know, I, I said, I don't know if I said this the other day, but, you know, and again, speaking about Jimmy, it was Jimmy that really encouraged me to go and study the history of this place and, and, and to, told me things that, that I didn't know and, and, and it was wonderful. But in my studies, I discovered that at the, the peak of this ministry here, the Foundry Boys, which was pioneered by Mary Ann Clough and uh, then picked up by uh, the other men, at the very peak of this ministry, in Foundry Boys, and of course it wasn't here just in Garden Garden, it was throughout the, the city and, and the west of Scotland. There were 20,000 children attending Foundry Boys at its peak. That's just children, okay? Now if you had a 20,000 strong ministry in Glasgow today, it would be a mega church. There, there are churches in America that don't have that. And and of course, that was during the First World War, just, just about the first time of the First World War at its peak. Some of you might remember the First World War. <laughs> uh, but, and of course, but, but even after that peak, there were still many, many, many people would come here. And this was just one ministry, one children's ministry. To think and, and go and study it, that wee book that, that Jimmy spoke about, the Virtue from Adversity book that the Foundry Boys is, is in. A wonderful book all about the missions in Glasgow and all the great moves of God. We need to get that back, brothers and sisters. We need to get those, those days back, but not just so for nostalgia's sake, but we need to do it because we want to see it in our generation. So he says here, verse 9, Surely the isles shall wait for me. Surely. Or look to me, is really what it, what it means. Surely the elves will look to me. What he's saying here is this. What God is saying, what the prophet is saying, is that it's definitely going to be the case that the elves will look to me, will wait for me, will pursue me, will seek after me. What elves is he speaking about here? He's talking about the British elves. I don't have time to again explain. Some of you are aware um, of, of that. But when you, when you consider... Uh, the, uh, in the Middle East at that time and, and Israel at that time going back two and a half thousand years they understood what the isles and coastlands meant it was, it was what the Romans would call Ultima Thule the end of the world the end of the, the, end of the, the known world the European northwest of Europe and the British Isles Isaiah from about chapter 40 onwards uh, is speaking to a future generation or future generations of God's people who live in the isles and the ends of the earth. And these weren't just terms that you just asked, the ends of the earth. We would say, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do something that will go to the ends of the earth. But back then, that was a specific geographic location. And it was this part of the world. So God is saying, surely the isles shall wait for me, shall look to me, shall seek me. Now, I know you may say, well, we live in a Britain today, we live in British Isles today, and we've just had these statistics that come out that say that most people in Britain are not interested in God or religion or faith or any of these things. We live in a secular world. We live in a, a world that people aren't interested. And you know, I've tried to share with my neighbour and she just poo-poos me. It's easy to think, well, they're not interested in our message. But thank God... Last night in the hydro, that, that theory was, was blown out of the water because people came to faith in Christ. And not just the one-off thing, it's great to celebrate that, but it's happening throughout the city, it's happening throughout the British Isles. People are turning to faith, and I do believe, uh, turning to Christ, and I do believe that it will grow, the momentum will grow, and we'll see a mighty move of God. He says, surely it's going to happen in the Isles. And then he says this, he name checks us here. <laughs> he says, and the ships of Tarshish, first it says that in the King James, but the word Tharsis is um, the Septuagint way, um, a, a translation from Greek to English, 
Tharsis is exactly the same as Tarshish. So he says, and the ships of Tharsis first. So I believe we're in the Bible. Amen? Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tharsis first. Why? To bring thy sons from far. There it is again. Bringing in the end time harvest. You know, um, if, you, if you're a Western fan like me, amen? And I, I remember Jimmy loved, loved that as well. Bringing in the sheaves. Standing on the prairies, yeah? At the graveside. Bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, amen? Now, that's what he's saying here, to bring in the sheaves, to bring thy sons from far. What he's saying here is that they're coming. People are coming to bring thy sons. Their silver and their gold with them, and that means we're going to have good collections, good offerings. That's exactly what it means. What he's saying, and why does he mention the wealth? Here's why. Not just because of wealth transfer, but here's why. Because he's talking about committed people. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's easy to pay lip service, but when you, he's talking about people who are invested in the kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? In other words, the real believers, not just part time believers, or not just um, lukewarm believers. They're people that are invested in the kingdom of God. Unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified thee. Verse 11 says this, Your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the wealth of a nation, the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. Well, I'm looking forward to to the church being open 24-7, seven days a week. Amen? Uh, and some of you might be on the night shift. You say, it's going to, it'll be like a chapel then. Remember, chapels used to be open all the time. Well, do you know, so did some churches. But what he's, what he's really saying here is he's saying that you'll be so busy that people will keep coming. That's... My vision for this place. It would be my vision for any church I pastored. Because let me just say this, if we're not here to make a difference, and we're not here to be open to the community, and we're not here for people to come and know the Lord, then, then why are we here? Like I said, Agnes's cooking's not that fabulous. Don't tell her I said it. Though. But this is a vision, brothers and sisters, that we have in this. And it's, I don't just mean it's the vision for this church. Of course it is, but it's a vision for church universal that people would keep coming. Like we saw in Isaiah chapter 2, we might go there in a wee minute again to see it. And we say, well, we've been before, but you know, we need to keep repeating these scriptures and read them. I, I actually put Isaiah 60, I put it on quite a bit on YouTube and just play it through over and over because... To, to capture that vision of an end time church that is open for business and people coming in, not just, oh, well, we've got a, a wee meeting in the sa a sa a Sunday morning and remember we used to have our Tuesday meeting. We don't want just wee meetings here and there. We want to be open for business because we are about the business of the kingdom. We are about the business, about our father's business. And his, our father's business is to get people saved and discipled. Amen. So, it even says, The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Even the folks that don't like what we're about here. And we, we've had that, haven't we? We've had that here. We've had it in recent times. You know, I thought we were doing pretty bad when we were getting a chat with vandalism and so on until I found out a, a, a friend of mine who's not far from here, his church, they're getting firebombed. Now I know I've been told we've been firebombed here in the past. What it's saying here is even the folks that hate us are going to end up coming and saying, oh no, no, sorry. Can we come to your church? Praise the Lord. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated so that no man went through you, I will make you an eternal excellency. 
the joy of many generations. And I like this wee bit here, verse 17. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood brass, and for stones iron. I will also make thy officers peace, and thine exactors righteousness. What he's saying here is, it's going to be a continual upgrade. Amen? It's going to be constantly getting better. You know, um, what does it say? Brass, sorry, gold is better than brass. Amen? And silver's better than iron. What he's saying here is, I will keep improving and upgrading what you do. And then he says, I will make your officers peace and your exactors righteousness. That's a promise that we will have righteous government. That we will have righteous counsellors, not people in it for their own business, for their own, um, you know, improve, self improvement, but that we're going to be. And, and I'm taking that as a promise for this city. Amen. So, in other words, it will not just impact us in church; it will impact government. It will impact society. And I will say this to brothers and sisters: if it doesn't, then it's not worth it. Praise the Lord. Do you agree? Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 2 because he's talking much about the same thing here. And we'll, we'll close with this, Isaiah chapter 2. We've looked at it before in our studies here in Isaiah 60 because it's very much linked, but let's do it again. It says here, it shall come to pass, verse 2, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Are we living in the last days? Then it says here, it shall come to pass. In other words, this is going to happen. And there's no if, there's no condition. It just says, this shall come to pass in the last days. Now, there's no if or condition, but I do believe we can pray this in a manifestation. Does that make sense? If we're just casual, ah, well, it's going to happen. Who cares? You know, it's going to happen anyway, pastor. No, I'm saying. No, let's pray that it happens. And we see it happen. It shall come to pass in the last days, what? That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. In other words, what's going on in God's house, the church, is going to be the thing that is predominant amongst all other aspects of society and over and above all other things. It is established in the top of the mountains. Mountains here means all the kingdoms and empires and institutions and powers of man. The Bible says the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and he's going to do it through the church. In other words, that the church is going to be in the top of everything, the priority of everyone. I remember reading a book on the King James Bible, and the Bible uh, at that time in 17th century Britain, and they were saying that the people were so obsessed with the Word of God in 17th century Britain, England and Scotland and, and so on, that they would have debates in Parliament about portions of Scripture. And they would say, right, let's look at Romans such and such. And one MP would stand up and say, well, this is my interpretation. And someone else, oh, no, well, I, I, I see it this way. Imagine that happening in 2024 Britain, that they were so obsessed with the word. And it said that many, many homes would have hangings and coverings in their home covered in scripture verses. And the reason being is that in 17th century Scotland, 17th century England, there was an obsession with people and with politicians, rulers, leaders with God's word. Now folks, imagine that in our day and age. I'm believing for that. Amen. Where it's not about a party policy and so on. It's not scoring points off each other. It's about God's word. And you say, well, that, that's crazy. How will that ever happen? Well, it's already happened. It's what we need to get back to, not just what we, oh, well, you know, that, that, that would be amazing. Well, it's already happened. And we need that again. It says here, watch this, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And watch what it says. And all nations shall flow unto it. We just read about the wealth of the nations coming to the church. 
And it's saying here the same thing. Nations are going to flow unto the church, unto the ecclesia, unto the mountain of the Lord's house, which we would say today is church or ecclesia. And look at this. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Or they'll say to you, Are you going to church? Have you got room in your car? Many people. See, we're not here just for the, the few. Oh, well, it'll be good. To you. Oh, it's great. You know, we, got a, we got a new family come to church 10 years ago. Oh, wasn't that wonderful? No, it's many people, multitudes. Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to have the vision of multitudes. Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Or we would say from out of Zion city church shall go forth the law. Zion literally means the people of God or the, the church, the ecclesia, where God's word is faithfully preached. And we are not the only church that does that. Let's be honest. But we're the best. <laughs> Amen. No, what I'm saying is, where God's word is faithfully preached, where the people of God truly are. And so, what a great vision that we have, brothers and sisters, that what we are engaged in, our faith, is not just some futile exercise, but that we are part of a much bigger thing going on in the earth called the church, the ecclesia, the mountain of the Lord's house, all the different names that Scripture gives it. Gives it. And Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we're part of the winning team. Amen? We are part of God's victorious army. And we don't, we don't get arrogant about it. We don't get big-headed about it. We just thank God that what we're engaged in is we're on the victory side. Amen? So if you're on the victory side, that you, you need to have a smile on your face uh, rather than doom and gloom. But look what it says, verse 4. We'll close with this. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now we looked at this you know, uh, in the last few weeks. We need to re-emphasize it. We are living in perilous times where they're talking about nuclear war could break out. They're talking about, we've seen the wars in Ukraine. We've seen the war in the, uh, in, in the Middle East and China, Taiwan. Wars, rumours of wars, threats of wars. But the Bible here tells us very, very clearly that because of God's people and the proclamation of the gospel and the people taking heed to that, many people say, look, we've had enough of the fighting. We've had enough of the bickering. We've had enough of doing, doing things the politicians' way. We've had enough of what's going on. We've had enough of woke ideology. It's time to go back to the Bible. It's time to go back to the people of God. It's time to go back to church. And the Bible tells us, as a result of this, the nations will lay down their weapons. Isn't that good news? I don't want to be standing here one day and looking over to Fastlane, or Fastlane, and seeing the big light in the sky, and then all the electricity going off, and that's us, we're plunged into nuclear winter. I don't want that. Do you want that? But what we do want is peace to break forth, and it says that nations shall not learn war anymore. War is a learned thing. You have to learn that, okay? Um, you, you, it's something that we, we, we learn, but it says that we're going to unlearn war. And peace will break out. Anyway, that's it for today, folks. The Lord bless you.